builders. Writers who write about writers can easily bring on the worst kind of literary miscarriage. Everybody knows that. Start a story off with, Craig crushed out his cigarette and lunged for the typewriter, and there isn't an editor in the United States who will feel like reading your next sentence. So don't worry, this is going to be a straight, no-nonsense piece of fiction about a cab driver, a movie star, and an eminent child psychologist, and that's a promise. But you'll have to be patient for a minute, because there's going to be a writer in it too. I won't call him Craig, and I can guarantee that he won't get away with being the only sensitive person among the characters. But we're going to be stuck with him right along, and you better count on his being awkward and obtrusive as writers nearly always are, in fiction or in life. Thirteen years ago, in 1948, I was 22 and employed as a rewrite man on the financial news desk of the United Press. The salary was $54 a week, and it wasn't much of a job, but it did give me two good things. One was that whenever anybody asked me what I did, I could say, work for the UP, which had a jaunty sound. The other was that every morning I could turn up at the Daily News building wearing a jaded look, a cheap trench coat that had shrunk a size too small for me, and a much-handled brown fedora. Battered is the way I would have described it then. And I'm grateful that I know a little more about how about honesty in the use of words. It was a handled hat, handled by the endless nervous pinchings and shapings and reshapings. It wasn't battered at all. What I'm getting at is that just for those few minutes each day, walking up the slight hill of the last hundred yards between the subway exit and the news building, I was Ernest Hemingway reporting for the for work at the Kansas City Star. Had Hemingway been to war and back for before his 20th birthday? Well, so had I. And all right, maybe there were no wounds or medals for valor in my case, but the basic fact of the matter was there. Had Hemingway bothered about anything as time-wasting and career-delaying as going to college? Hell no. And me neither. Could Hemingway ever really have cared very much about the newspaper business? Of course not. So there was only a marginal difference, you see, between his lucky break at the star and my own dismal stint on the financial desk. The important thing, as I knew Hemingway would be the first to agree, was that a writer had to begin somewhere. Domestic corporate bonds moved irregularly higher in the moderately active trading today. That was the kind of prose I wrote all day long for the UP Wire. And... Rising oil shares paced a lively curb market, and directors of Timken Roller Bearing today declared hundreds on hundreds of words that I never really understood. What in the name of God are puts and calls, and what is a sinking fund debenture? I'm still damned if I know. While the teletypes chugged and rang and the Wall Street tickers ticked and everybody around me argued baseball, until it was mercifully time to go home. It always pleased me to reflect that Hemingway had married young. I could go right along with him there. My wife Joan and I lived as far west as you can get on West 12th Street in a big three-window room on the third floor. And if it wasn't the left bank, it certainly wasn't our fault. Every evening after dinner, while Joan washed the dishes, there would be a, a respectful, almost reverent hush in the room. And this was the time for me to retire behind a three-fold screen in the corner where a table, a student lamp, and a portable typewriter were set up. But it was here, of course, under the white stare of that lamp, <clears throat> that the tenuous parallel between Hemingway and me endured its heaviest strain. Because it wasn't any up in Michigan that came out of my machine. It wasn't any three-day blow or the killers. Very often, in fact, it wasn't really anything at all. And even, and even when it was something Joan called marvelous, I knew deep down that it was always, always something bad. There were evenings, too, when all I did behind the scene was goof off. Read every word of the printing on the inside of a matchbook, say, or all the ads in the back of the Saturday Review of Literature. It was during one of those times in the fall of the year that I came across these lines. Unusual freelance opportunity for talented writer. Must have imagination, Bernard Silver. 
and then a phone number what, with what looked like a Bronx exchange. I won't bother giving you the dry, witty Hemingway dialogue that took place when I came out from behind the screen that night, and Joan turned around from the sink, with her hands dripping soap suds on the open magazine. And we can also skip my cordial, unenlightening chat with Bernard Silver on the phone. I'll just move on ahead to a couple of nights later, when I rode the subway for an hour and found my way at last to his apartment. Mr. Prentice, he inquired. What's your first name again? Bob? Good. Bob. I'm Bernie. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. And I think both Bernie and his home deserve a little description here. He was in his middle or late 40s, a good deal shorter than me, and much stockier, wearing an expensive-looking pale blue sports shirt with the tails out. His head must have been half again the size of mine, with thinning black hair washed straight back as if he'd stood face up in the shower, and his face was one of the most guileless and self-confident faces I'd ever seen, I've ever seen. The apartment was always very clean, spacious, and cream-colored, full of carpeting and archways, and the narrow alcove near the coat closet, take your coat and hat, good, let's put this on a hanger here and we'll be all set, good. I saw a cluster of framed photographs showing World War I soldiers in various groupings, but on the walls of the living room there were no pictures of any kind, only a few wrought iron lamp brackets and a couple of mirrors. Once inside the room, you weren't apt to notice the lack of pictures, though, because all your attention was drawn to a single amazing piece of furniture. I don't know what you'd call it, a credenza? But whatever it was, it seemed to go on forever, chest high in some places and waist high in others, made of at least three different shades of polished brown veneer. Part of it was a television set. Part of it was a radio phonograph. Part of it thinned out into shelves that held potted plants and little figurines. Part of it, full of chromium knobs and tricky sliding panels, was a bar. Ginger ale, he asked. My wife and I don't drink, but I can offer you a glass of ginger ale. I think Bernie's wife must have always gone out to the movies on nights when he interviewed his writing applicants. I did meet her later, though, and we'll come to that. Anyway... There were just the two of us that first evening settling down in slippery leatherette chairs with our ginger ale, and it was strictly business. First of all, he said, don't tell me, or tell me, Bob, do you know my flag is down? And before I could ask what he was talking about, he around the drugstores drug purporting to be the memoirs of a New York taxi cab driver. Then he began to fill me in, while I looked at the book and nodded and wished I'd never left home. Bernard Silver was a cab driver, too. He had been one for 22 years, as long as the span of my life. And in the last two or three of these years, he had begun to see no reason why a slightly fictionalized version of his own experiences shouldn't be worth a fortune. I'd like you to take a look at this, he said. And this time, the credenza yielded an, up a neat little box of 3 by 5 inch file cards. Hundreds of experiences, he told me, all different. And while he gave me to under to understand that they might not all be strictly true, he could assure me that there was at least a kernel of truth in every last one of them. Could I imagine what a really good ghostwriter might do with a wealth of material like that? Or how much the same writer might expect to salt away when his own fat share of the magazine sales, the book royalties, and the movie rights came in? Well, I don't know, Mr. Silver. It's a thing I'd have to think over. I guess I'd have to read this other book first and see if I thought there was any... No, wait a while. You're getting way ahead of me here, Bob. In the first place, I wouldn't want you to read that book because you wouldn't learn anything. That guy is all gangsters and dames and sex and drinking and that stuff. I'm completely different. And I sat sw swilling ginger ale as if I... As if to slake a gargan... Or <laughs> as if to slake a gargantuan thirst in order to be able to leave as soon as possible after he'd finished explaining how completely different he was. Bernie Silver was a warm person, he told me, an ordinary, everyday guy with a heart as big as all outdoors and a real philosophy of life. Did I know what he meant? I have a trick of tuning out on people. It's easy. 
All you do is fix your eyes on the speaker's mouth and watch the rhythmic, endlessly changing shapes of lips and tongue. And the first thing you know, you can't hear a word. And I was about to start doing that when he said, And don't misunderstand me, Bob. I never yet asked a writer to do a single word for me on spec. You write for me, you'll be paid for everything you do. Naturally, it can't be very big dough at this stage of the game, but you'll be paid. Fair enough. Here, let me fill up your glass. This was the proposition. He'd give, him, he'd give me an idea out of the file. I'd develop it into a first-person short story by Bernie Silver between one and 2,000 words in length, for which immediate payment was guaranteed. If he liked the job I did, there would be plenty of others where it came from. An assignment a week, if I could handle that much. And in addition to my initial payment, of course, I could look forward to a generous percentage of whatever subsequent income the material might bring. He chose to be a winkingly mysterious about his plans for marketing the stories, though he did manage to hint that the Reader's Digest might be interested. And he was frank to admit he didn't yet have a publisher lined up for the ultimate book they, they would comprise, but he said he could give me a couple of names that would knock my eye out. Had I ever heard, for example, of Manny Weedman? Or maybe, he said, breaking into his all-out smile, maybe you know him better as Wade Manley? And this was the shining name of a movie star, a man about as famous in the 30s and 40s as Kirk Douglas or Burt Lancaster today. Wade Manley had been a grammar school friend of Bernie's right here in the Bronx, through mutual friends, they had managed to remain sentimentally close ever since, and one of the things that kept their friendship green was Wade Manley's oft-repeated desire to play the role of t rough, lovable Bernie Silver, New York hacky, in any film or television series based on his colorful life. Now, I'll give you another name, he said, and this time he squinted cannily at me while pronouncing it, as if my recognizing it or not would be an index of my general education level, Dr. Alexander Corvo. And luckily, I was able not to look too blank. It wasn't a celebrity name exactly, but it was far from ob obscure. It was one of those New York Times names, the kind of which tens of thousands of people are dimly aware because they've been coming across respectful mentions of them in the Times for years. Oh, it might have lacked the impact of Lionel Trilling or Rein Reinhold Niebuhr, but it was along that line. You could probably have put it in the same class with Huntington Hartford or Leslie R. Groves, and a good cut or two above Newbold Morris. The, what do you call it, man, you mean, I said, the childhood tensions man. Bernie gave me a solemn nod, forgiving this vulgarity, and spoke the name again with its proper identification. I mean, Dr. Alexander Corvo, the eminent child psychologist. Early in its rise to eminence, you see, Dr. Corvo had been a teacher at the very same grammar school in the Bronx, and two of the most unruly, dearly loved little rascals in his charge, there had been Bernie Silver and Manny, what's his name, the movie star. He still retained an incurable soft spot for both youngsters, and nothing would please him more today than to lend whatever influence he might have in the publishing world to furthering their project. All the three of them needed now, it seemed, was to find the final element, that elusive catalyst, the perfect writer for the job. Bob, said Bernie, I'm telling you the truth. I've had one writer after another working on this, and none of them's been right. Sometimes I don't trust my own judgment. I take their stuff to Dr. Corvo, and he shakes his head. He says, Bernie, try again. Look, Bob, he came earnestly forward in his chair. This isn't any fly-by-night idea here. I'm not stringing, stringing anybody along. This thing is building. Manny, Dr. Corvo, and myself, we're building this thing. Oh, don't worry, Bob, I know. What do I look, or what, do I look that stupid? I know they're not building the way I'm building, and why should they? A big movie star? A distinguished scholar and author? You think they haven't got a plenty of things of their own to build? A lot more important things than this? Naturally. But Bob, I'm telling you the truth. They're interested. I can show you letters. I can tell you many times they sat around, they've sat around this apartment with their wives, or 
Manny has anyway, and we've talked about it for out. We've talked about it hours on end. They're interested. Nobody has to worry about that. So do you see what I'm telling you, Bob? I'm telling you the truth. This thing is building. And he began a slow, two-handed building gesture, starting from the carpet, setting invisible blocks into place until they'd made a structure of money and fame for him. Money and freedom for both of us that rose to the level of our eyes. I said it certainly did sound fine, but that if he didn't mind, I'd like to know a little more about the immediate payment for the individual stories. And now I'll give you the answer to that one, he said. He went to the credenza again. Part of it seemed to be a kind of desk. And after sorting out some papers, he came up with a personal check. I won't just tell you, he said, I'll show you. Fair enough. This was my last writer. Take it and read it. It was a canceled check, and it said that Bernard Silver had paid, to the order of some name, the sum of $25 and no cents. Read it, he insisted, as if the check were a prose work of uncommon merit in its own right. And he watched me while I turned it over to read the man's endorsement, which had been signed under some semi-legible words of Bernie's own about this being advance payment in full, and the bank rub and the bank's rubber stamp. Look all right to you? He inquired. So that's the arrangement. All clear now? I guessed it was as clear as it ever would be. So I gave him back the check and said that if he'd show me one of the file cards now or whatever, we might as well get going. Wait a minute now. Hold your horses a minute here. His smile was enormous. You're a pretty fast guy, you know that, Bob? I mean, I like you. But don't you think I'd have to be a little bit of a dope to go around making out checks to everybody walking walked Don't you think I'd have to be a dope to go around making out checks to everybody walked in here saying they're a writer? I know you're a newspaper man. Fine. Do I know you're a writer yet? Why don't you let me see what you got there in your lap? It was a manila envelope containing carbon copies of the only two halfway presentable short stories I had ever managed to produce in my life. Well, I said, sure. Here. Of course, these are a very different kind of thing than what you're... Never mind, never mind. Naturally, they're different, he said, opening the envelope. You just relax a minute and let me take a look. What I mean is, they're both very kind of, well, literary, I guess you'd say. I don't quite see how they'll give you any real idea of my... Relax, I said. Rimless glasses were withdrawn from the pocket of his sports shirt and placed laboriously into position as he settled back, frowning to read. It took him a long time to get through the first page of the first story, and I watched him, wondering if this might turn out to be the very lowest point in my literary career. A cab driver, for Christ's sake. At last, the first page turned, and the second page followed so closely after it that I could tell he was skipping. Then the third and the fourth, it was a 12 or 14 page story while I gripped my empty warming ginger ale glass as if in readiness to haul off and throw it at his head. A very slight, hesitant, then more and more judicial nodding set in as he made his way toward the end. He finished it, looked puzzled, went back to read over the last page again. Then he laid it aside and picked up the second story. Not to read it, but only to check it for length. He had clearly had enough reading for one night. Off came the glasses, and on came the smile. Well, very nice, he said. I won't take time to read this other one now, but the first one, this first one's very nice. Of course, naturally, as you said, this is a very different kind of material you got here. So it's a little hard for me to, you know. And he dismissed the rest of this difficult sentence with a wave of the hand. I'll tell you what, though, Bob. Instead of just reading here, let me ask you a couple questions about writing. For example... He closed his eyes and delicately touched their lids with his fingers, thinking, or more likely pretending to think, in order to give added weight to his next words. For example, let me ask you this. Supposing somebody writes you a letter and says, Bob, I didn't have time to write you a short letter today, so I had to write you a long one instead. Would you know what they meant by that? Don't worry, I played this part of the evening pretty cool. I wasn't going to let 25 bucks get away from me without some kind of struggle. And my answer, whatever sober-sided nonsense it was, could have left no doubt in his mind that this particular writing candidate knew something of the difficult value of compression in prose. He seemed 
he seemed gratified by it anyway. Good. Now let's try a different angle. I mentioned I mentioned about building a while back. Well, look, do you see where writing a story is building something too? Like building a house? And he was so pleased with his own creation of this image that he didn't even wait to take it in the careful, congratulatory nod I awarded him for it. I mean, a house has got to have a roof, but you're going to be in trouble if you build your roof first, right? Before you build your roof, you got to build your walls. Before you build your walls, you got to lay your foundation. And I mean, all the way down the line. Before you lay your foundation, you got to bulldoze and dig yourself the right kind of hole in the ground. Am I right? I couldn't have agreed with him more, but he was still ignoring my rapt, toadying gaze. He rubbed the flange of his nose with one wide knuckle, then he turned on me triumphantly again. So, all right. Supposing you build yourself a house like that, then what? What's the first question you got to ask yourself about it when it's done? But I could tell he didn't care if I muffed this one or not. He knew what the question was, and he could hardly wait to tell me. Where are the windows? He demanded, spreading his hands. That's the question. Where does this light come in? But do you see what I mean about the light coming in, Bob? I mean, the, the philosophy of your story, the truth of it, the, the illumination of it, sort of, I said. And he quit groping for the third noun with a profound and happy snap of his fingers. That's it, Bob. That's it. You got it. It was a deal, and we had another ginger ale to clinch it as he thumbed through the idea of file for my trial assignment. The experience he chose was the time Bernie Silver had saved a, ne a neurotic couple's marriage, right there in the cab, simply by sizing them up in his rearview mirror as they quarreled, and putting in a few well-chosen words of his own. Or at least that was the general drift of it. All it actually said on the card was something like, High class man and wife, Park Avenue, start fighting in cab. Very upset. Lady starts yelling divorce. I watched them in the rear view and put my two cents worth in, and soon we were all we are all laughing. Story about marriage, etc. But Bernie expressed full confidence in my ability to work the thing out. In the alcove, as he went through the elaborate business of getting my trench coat out of the closet and helping me on with it, I had time for a better look at the World War I photographs. A long company lineup. A number of framed yellow snapshots showing laughing men with their arms around each other, and one central picture of a lone bugler on a parade ground, with dusty barracks and a flag high in the distance. It could have been on the cover of an old American Legion magazine, with a caption like, Duty, the perfect soldier, slim and straight at attention, and gold star mothers would have wept over the way his fine young profile was pressed in manly reverence against the mouth of his simple, eloquent horn. I see you like my boy there, Bernie said fondly. I bet you'd never guess who that boy is today. Wade Manley, Dr. Alexander Corvo, Lionel Trilling. But I suppose I really did know, even before I glanced around at his blushing, beaming presence. That boy was Bernie himself. And whether it sounds silly or not, I'll have to tell you that I felt a small but honest-to-God admiration for him. Well, I'll be damned, Bernie. You look, you look pretty great there. Lot skinnier in those days, anyway, he said, slapping his silken paunch as he walked me to the door. And I remember looking down into his dumb, big, dumb, flabby face and trying to find the bugler's features somewhere inside it. On my way home, rocking on the subway and faintly belching and tasting ginger ale, I grew increasingly aware that a writer could do a hell of a lot worse than to pull down $25 for a couple of thousand words. It was very nearly half what I earned in 40 miserable hours among the domestic corporate bonds and the sinking fund debentures. And if Bernie liked this first one, I could go on doing one a week for him. It would be practically the same as getting a 50% raise. 79 a week. With that kind of dough coming in, as well as the 46 Joan brought home from her secretarial job, it would be no, no time at all before we had enough for Paris. And maybe we wouldn't meet any Gertrude Steins or Ezra Pounds there. Maybe I wouldn't produce any Sun Also Rises, but the earliest possible expatriation was not, nothing less than essential to my Hemingway plans. Besides, it might even be fun, or at least it might be fun to tell people about, I would be the hacky's hack, the builder's builder. 
In any case, I ran all the way down West 12th Street that night, and if I didn't burst in on her, laughing and shouting and clowning around, it was only because I forced myself to stand leaning against the mailboxes downstairs, mailboxes downstairs until I caught my breath and arranged my face into the urbane, amused expression I planned to use for telling her about it. Well, but who do you suppose is putting up all the money? She asked. It can't be out of his own pocket, can it? A cab driver couldn't afford to pay out 25 a week for any length of time, could he? It was one aspect of the thing that hadn't occurred to me, and it was just like her to come up with so dead logical a question. But I did my best to override her with my own kind of cynical romanticism. Who knows? Who the hell cares? Maybe Wade Manley's putting up the money. Maybe Dr. What do you call it's putting it up. The point is, it's there. Well, she said, good then. How long do you think it'll take you to do the story? Oh, hell, no time at all. We'll knock it off in a couple hours over the weekend. But I didn't. I spent all Saturday afternoon and evening on one false start after another. I kept getting hung up on, in the dialogue of the quarreling couple and in technical uncertainties about how much Bernie could really see of them in his rearview mirror, and in doubts about what any code. By Sunday afternoon, I was walking around breaking pencils in half and throwing them into the wastebasket and saying the hell with it. The hell with everything. Apparently, I couldn't even be a goddamn ghostwriter for a goddamn ignorant slob of a driver of a goddamn taxi cab. You're trying too hard. John said. Oh, I knew this would happen. You're being so insufferably literary about it, Bob. It's ridiculous. All you have to do is think of every corny, tear-jerking thing you've ever read or heard. Think of Irving Berlin. And I told her I'd give Irving Berlin right... Give her... Ir <laughs> and I told her I'd give her Irving Berlin right in the mouth in about a minute if she didn't lay off me and mind her own goddamn business. But late that night, as Irving Berlin himself might say, something kind of wonderful happened. I took that little bastard of a story and I built the hell out of it. First, I bulldozed and dug and laid myself a real good foundation. Then I got the lumber out and bang, bang, bang. Up went the walls and on went the roof and up went the cute little chimney top. Oh, I put plenty of windows in it too, big square ones. And when the light came pouring in it, left no earthly shadow of a doubt that Bernie Silver was the wisest, gentlest, bravest, and most lovable man who ever said folks. It's perfect, Joan told me at breakfast after she'd read the thing. Oh, it's just perfect, Bob. I'm sure that's just exactly what he wants. And it was. I'll never forget the way Bernie sat with his ginger ale in one hand and my trembling manuscript in the other, reading his... I'd still be willing to bet he'd never read before, exploring all the snug and tidy wonders of the little home I'd built for him. I watched him discovering each of those windows, one after the other, and saw his face made holy with their light. When he was finished, he got up. We both got up, and he shook my hand. Beautiful, he said. Bob, I had a feeling you'd do a good one, but I'll tell you the truth. I didn't know you'd do as good a one as this. Now you want your check, and I'll tell you something. You're not getting any check. For this, you get cash. He came his, Out came his trusty black cab driver's wallet. He thumbed through its contents, picked out a $5 bill, and laid it in my hand. He evidently wanted to make a ceremony out of presenting me with one bill after another. So I stood smiling down at it, waiting for the, rest, for the next one. And I was still standing there with my hand out when I looked up and saw him putting the wallet away. Five bucks? And even now I wish I could say that I shouted this, or at least I said it with some suggestion of the outrage that gripped my bowels. It might have saved an awful moment of trouble later, but the truth is that it came out as a very small, meek question. Five bucks? Right. He was rocking happily back on his heels in the carpet. Well, but Bernie, I mean, what's the deal? I mean, you showed me that check, and I... As his smile dwindled, his face looked as shocked and it hurt as if I spat into it. Oh, Bob, he said. Bob, what is this? Look, let's not play any games here. I know I showed you that check. I'll show you that check again. And the folds of his sports shirt quivered in righteous indignation as he rummaged in the credenza and brought it out. 
It was the same check, all right. It still read $25 and no cents. But Bernie's cramped scribbling on the other side above the other man's signature and all mixed up with the rub bank's rubber stamp was now legible as hell. What it said, of course, was, in full advance payment, five write-ups. So I hadn't really been robbed. Conned a little, maybe, that's all. And therefore, my main problem now, the sick ginger ale-flavored feeling that I was certain Ernest Hemingway could never in his life have known, was my own sense of being a fool. Am I right or wrong, Bob? He was asking. Am I right or wrong? And then he sat me down again and did his smiling best to set me straight. How could I possibly have thought he meant 25 at a time? 25 a time. Did I have any idea what kind of money a hacky took home? Oh, some of your own nerd drivers, maybe. It was a different story. But your average hacky? Your fleet hacky? 40, 45, maybe sometimes 50 a week if they were lucky. Even for a man like himself, with no kids and a wife working full-time at the telephone company, it was no picnic. I could ask any hacky if I didn't believe him. It was no picnic. And I mean, you don't think anybody else is picking up the tab for these write-ups, do you? Do you? He looked at me incredulously, almost ready to laugh, as if the very idea of my thinking such a thing would remove all reasonable doubt about my having been born yesterday. Bob, I'm sorry there was any misunderstanding here, he said, walking me to the door, but I'm glad we're straight on it now, because I mean it. That's a beautiful piece you wrote, and I've got a feeling it's gonna go places. Tell you what, Bob, I'll be in touch with you later this week, okay? And I remember despising myself, because I didn't have the guts to tell him not to bother anymore, then I could shake off the heavy, fatherly hand that rode on my neck as we walked. In the alcove, out in front of the young bugler again, I had a sudden disturbing notion that I could foretell an exchange of dialogue that was about to take place. I would say, Bernie, I, I would say, Bernie, were you really a bugler in the army or is that just for the picture? And with no trace of embarrassment, without the faintest flickering exchange in his guileless smile, he would say, just for the picture. Worse still, I knew that the campaign-headed head of the bugler himself would turn then, that the fine tense profile in the photograph would slowly loosen and turn away from the mouthpiece of a horn, through which its dumb, no-talent lips could never have blown a fart, and that it would wink at me. So I didn't risk it. I just said... See you, Bernie, and got the hell out of there and went home. Joan's reaction to the news was surprisingly gentle. I don't mean she was kind to me about it, which would have damn near killed me in the shape I was in that night. It was more that she was kind to Bernie. <clears throat> Poor, lost, brave little man, dreaming his and unlikely dream, that kind of thing. And could I imagine what it must have cost him over the years? How many of these miserably hard-earned $5 payments he must have dropped down the bottomless maw of second and third and tenth-rate amateur writers as needs? How lucky for him, then, through whatever dissemblings with his canceled check, to have made contact with a first-rate professional at last. And how touching and how sweet that he had recognized difference by saying, for this, you get cash. Well, but for Christ's sake, I told her, grateful that it could be, that it could for once be me instead of her who thought in terms of the deadly practicalities. For Christ's sake, you know why he gave me cash, don't you? Because he's going to sell this, that story to the Reader's Goddamn Digest next week for $150,000. Because if I had photo stated check, if I had a photo stated check to prove I wrote it, he'd be in trouble. That's why. Would you like to bet? She inquired, looking at me with her lovely, truly unforgettable mixture of pity and pride. Would you like to bet that if he does sell it to Reader's Digest or anywhere else, he'll insist on giving you half? Bob Prentice, said a happy voice on the telephone three nights later. Bernie Silver, Bob, I've just come from Dr. Alexander Corvo's home. And listen, I'm not going to tell you what he told me, but I'll tell you this. Dr. Alexander Corvo thinks you're pretty good. Whatever reply I made to this, does he really, or you mean he really likes it? It was something bashful and telling enough to bring Joan instantly to my side, all smiles. I remember the way she plucked at my shirt sleeve as if to say, there, 
What did I tell you? And I had to brush her away and wag my hand to keep her quiet during the rest of the talk. He wants to show it to a couple of his connections in the publishing field, Burning was saying. And he wants me to get another copy made up to send out to Manny on the coast. So listen, Bob. While we're waiting to see what happens on this one, I want to give you some more assignments. Or wait, listen. And his voice became enriched with the dawning of a new idea. Listen, maybe you'd be more comfortable working on your own. Would you rather do that? Would you rather just skip the card file and use your own imagination? Late one rainy night, deep in the Upper West Side, two thugs got into Bernie's Silver's cab. To the casual eyes, they might have looked like ordinary customers, but Bernie had spotted them right away because, take it from me, a man doesn't hack the streets of Manhattan for 22 years without a little specialized education rubbing off. One was a hardened criminal type, of course, and the other was a little more than a frightened boy, or rather, just a punk. I didn't like the way they were talking, Bernie told his readers through me, and I didn't like the ad address they gave me, the lowest dive in town. And most of all, I didn't like the fact that they were riding in my automobile. So do you know what he did? Oh, don't worry. He didn't stop the cab and step around and pull them out of the back seat and kick them one after the other into the groin, in the groin. None of that my flag is down nonsense. For one thing, he could tell from their talk that they weren't making a getaway. Not tonight, at least. All they'd done tonight was case the joint, a small liquor, liquor store near the corner where he'd picked them up. The job was set for tomorrow night at 11. Anyway, when they got to the lowest dive in town, the hardened criminal gave the punk some money and said, Here, kid, you keep the cab. Go on home and get some sleep. I'll see you tomorrow. And that was when Bernie knew what he had to do. That punk lived way out in Queens, which gave us plenty of time for conversation. So I asked him who he liked for the National League pennant. And from there on, with deep folk wisdom and consummate skill, Bernie kept up such a steady flow of talk about healthy, clean living, milk and sunshine topics that he began to draw the boy out of his hard delinquent shell even before they hit Queensboro, the Queensboro Bridge. They barreled along Queens Boulevard, chattering like a pair of police athletic league enthusiasts. And by the time the ride was over, Bernie's fare was practically in tears. I saw him swallow a couple of times when he paid me off. Was the was the way I had Bernie put it, and I had a feeling something had changed in that kid. I had a hope of it anyway, or maybe just a wish, but I knew I'd done all I could for him. Back in town, Ernie called the police and suggested they put a couple of men around the liquor store the following night. Sure enough, a job was attempted on that liquor store, only to be foiled by two tough, lovable cops. And sure enough, there was only one thug for them to carry off to the poke for them to carry off to the pokey. The hardened criminal one. I don't know where the kid was that night, Bernie concluded, but I like to think he was home in bed with a glass of milk reading, reading the sports page. There was the roof and there was the chimney top of it. There were all the windows with the light coming in. There was another approving chuckle from Dr. Alexander Corbo and another submission to Reader's Digest. There was another whisper for a chance for a Simon & Schuster contract in a $3 million production starring Wade Manley. And there was another five in the mail for me. A small, fragile old gentleman started crying in the cab one day, up around 59th and 3rd. And when Bernie said, anything I can help with, sir? There followed two and a half pages of the most tearing hard luck story I could imagine. He was a widower. His only daughter had long since married and moved away to Flint, Michigan. His life had been an agony of loneliness for 22 years, but he'd always been brave enough about it until now because he'd had a job he loved, tending the geraniums in a big commercial greenhouse. And now this morning, the management had told him he would have to go. Too old for that kind of work. And only then, according to Bernie Silver, did I make the connection between all this and the address he'd given me a corner near the Manhattan side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Bernie couldn't be sure, of course, that his fare planned to hobble right on out to the middle of the bridge and ease his old bones over the railing, but he couldn't take any chances either. I figured it was time for me to do some talking, and he was right about that. Another heavy half page of that tiresome old man's lament, and the story would have ruptured the hell out of its foundation. 
What came next was a brusque page and a half of dialogue in which Bernie discreetly inquired why the old man didn't go li and live with his daughter in Michigan, or at least write her a letter so that maybe she'd invite him. But, oh no, he only keened that he couldn't possibly be a burden on his daughter and her family. Burden? I said, acting like I didn't know what he meant. Burden. How could a nice old gentleman like you be a burden on anybody? But what else would I be? What can I offer them? Luckily, we were stopped at a red light when he asked me that. So I turned around and looked him straight in the eye. Mister, I said, don't you think that family, don't you think that family like having somebody around the place that knows a thing or two about growing geraniums? Well, by the time they got to the bridge, the old man had decided to have Bernie let him off at a nearby automat instead. Because he, because he said he felt like having a cup of tea. And so much for the walls of the damn thing. This was the roof. Six months later, Bernie received a small, heavy package with a Flint, Michigan postmark. Addressed to his taxi fleet garage. And do you know what, <laughs> do you know what was in that package? Of course you do. A potted geranium. And here's your chimney top. There was a also a little note written in what I'm afraid... I really did describe as a fine old spidery hand, and it read simply, thank you. Personally, I thought this one was loathsome, and Joan wasn't sure about it either, but we mailed it off anyway, and Bernie loved it. And so he told me over the phone, did his wife Rose. Which reminds me, Bob, the other reason I called. Rose wants me to find out what evening you and your wife could come up for a little get-together here. Nothing fancy, just the four of us have a little drink and chat. You think you might enjoy that? Well, that's very nice of you, Bernie, and of course we'd enjoy it very much. It's just that offhand, I don't know, I don't quite know when we could arrange to... Hold on a second. And I covered the mouthpiece and had an urgent conference about it with Joan in the hope she'd supply me with a graceful excuse. But she wanted to go, and she had just the right evening in mind, so all four of us were hooked. Oh, good, she said when I'd hung up. I'm glad we're going. They sound sweet. Now look, and I aimed my index finger at her, <laughs> and I aimed my index finger straight at her face. We're not going at all if you plan to sit around up there making them both aware of how sweet they are. I'm not spending any evenings as gracious Lady Bountiful's consort among the lower classes, and that's final. If you want to turn this thing into some goddamn Bennington girls' garden party for the servants, you can forget about that right now forget about it right now. You hear me? Then she, asked, then she asked me if I wanted to know something, and without waiting to find out whether I did or not, she told me. She told me I was just about the biggest snob and the biggest bully and biggest all-around loudmouth jerk she'd ever come across in her life. One thing led to another after that. By the time we were on the subway for our enjoyable get-together with the Silvers, we were only barely on speaking terms. And I can't tell you how grateful I was to find that the Silvers, while staying on the ginger ale themselves, had broken out a bottle of rye for their guests. Bernie's wife turned out to be a quick, spike-heeled, girdled, and bobby-pinned woman whose telephone operator's voice was chillingly expert at the social graces. How do you do? So nice to meet you. Come in. Please sit down. Bernie, help her. She can't get her coat off. God knows who started it or why, but the evening began uncomfortably with a discussion of politics. Joan and I were torn between Truman, Wallace, and not voting at all that year. The Silvers were dewy people, and what made it all the worse for our tender, liberal sensibilities was that Rose sought common ground by telling us one bleak tale after another, each with a more elaborate shudder about the inexorable, menacing encroachment of colored and Puerto Rican elements in this part of the Bronx. But things got jollier after a while. For one thing, they were both delighted with Joan. And I'll have to admit, I never met anyone who wasn't. And for another, the talk soon turned to the marvelous fact of their knowing Wade Manley, which gave rise to a series of proud rem um, reminiscences. Bernie never takes nothing off him, don't, though, don't worry. Rose assured us, Bernie, tell them what you did that time when he was here and you told him to sit down and shut up. He did. He did. He kind of gave him a push in the chest. This movie star. Ah, uh, sit down and shut up, Manny. We know who you are. Tell him, Bernie. 
and Bernie convulsed with pleasure, got up to reenact the scene. Oh, we were just kidding around, you understand, he said. But anyway, that's what I did. I gave him a shove like this, and I said, Ah, sit down and shut up, Manny. We know who you are. He did. That's the God's truth. Pushed him right down in that chair over there. Wade Manley. A little later, when Bernie and I had paired off for a man-to-man -man talk over the freshening of drinks, and Rose and Joan were cozily settled in the love seat, Rose directed a roguish glance at me. I wouldn't want to give this husband of yours a swelled head, Joni, but do you know what Dr. Cor Corvo told Bernie? Shall I tell her, Bernie? Sure, tell her, tell her. And Bernie waved the bottle of ginger ale in one hand and the bottle, bottle of rye in the other to show how openly all secrets could be bared tonight. Well, she said, Dr. Corvo said your husband is the finest writer Bernie's ever had. Later still, when Bernie and I were in the love seat and the ladies were at the credenza, I began to see that Rose was a builder too. Maybe she hadn't built the credenza with her own hands, but she'd clearly done more than her share of building whatever heartfelt convictions were need needed to sustain the hundreds on hundreds of dollars its purchase might be costing them on the installment plan. A piece of furniture like that was an investment in the future. And now, as she stood fussing over it and wiping off little parts of it while she talked to Joan, I could have sworn I saw her arranging a future party in her mind. Joan and I would be among the, those present, that much was certain. This is Mr. Robert Prentice, my husband's assistant, and Miss, Pres Miss Prentice. And the rest of the guest list was almost a foregone conclusion, too. Wade Manley and his wife, of course, along with a careful selection of their Hollywood friends. Walter Winchell would be there, and Earl Wilson, and Toot Shore, and all that crowd. But far more important for any person of refinement would be the presence of Dr. and Mrs. Alexander Corvo, and some of the people who comprised their set. People like the Lionel Trillings and the Reinhold Niebers, the Huntington Hartfords and the Leslie R. Groveses, and if anybody on the order of Mr. and Mrs. Newbold Morris wanted to come, you could be damn sure they'd have to do some pretty fancy jockeying for the, an invitation. It was, as Joan admitted later, stifling hot in the Silvers' apartment that night. And I cite this as a presentable excuse for the fact that what I did next, it took a, me a hell of a lot less time to do it in 1948 than it does now, believe me, was to get roaring drunk. Soon as I was not only the most vociferous, but the only talker in the room, I was explaining that, by Jesus God, we'd all four of us be millionaires yet. And wouldn't we have a ball? Oh, we'd be slapping Lionel Trilling around and pushing him down into every chair in this room and telling him to shut up. And you too, Reinhold Niebuhr, you pompous, sanctimonious old fool, where's your money? Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Bernie was chuckling and looking sleepy, and Joan was looking humiliated for me, and Rose was smiling in cool but infinite understanding of how tiresome husbands could be sometimes be. Then we were all out in the alcove, trying on at least half a dozen coats apiece, and I was looking at the bugler's photograph again, wondering if I dared to ask my burning question about it. But this time I wasn't sure which I feared more, that Bernie might say, just for the picture, or that he might say, sure I was go rummaging in the closet or in some part of the credenza until he'd come up with the tarnished old bugle itself. And we'd all have to go back and sit down again while Bernie puts, put his heels together, drew himself erect, and sounded the pure, sad mel melody of taps for us all. That was in October. I'm a little vague on how many by Bernie Silver stories I turned out during the rest of the fall. I do remember a a comic relief one about a fat tourist who got stuck at the waist when he tried to climb up through the sky view window of the cab for better sightseeing, and a very solemn one in which Bernie delivered a lecture on racial tolerance, which struck a sour note with me, considering the way he'd chimed in with Rose's views on the brown hordes advancing over the Bronx. But mostly what I remember about him during that period is that Joan and I could never seem to mention him without getting into some kind of argument. When she said we really ought to return his and Rose's invitation, for example, I told her not to be silly. I said I was sure they wouldn't expect it. And when she said why, I gave her a crisp, impatient briefing on the hopelessness of trying to ignore class barriers and pretending that the Silvers could ever really become our friends or that they'd ever really want to. 
Another time, toward the end of a curiously dull evening when we'd gone to our favorite premarital restaurant and failed for an hour to find anything to talk about, she tried to get the conversation going by leaning romantically towards, toward me across the table and holding up her wine glass. Here's to Bernie selling your last one to the Reader's Digest. Yeah, I said, sure. Big deal. Oh, don't be so gruff. You know perfectly well it could happen any day. We might make a lot of money and go to Europe and everything. Are you kidding? It suddenly annoyed me that any intelligent, well-educated girl in the 20th century could be so gullible. And that such a girl should actually be my wife. That I would be expected to go on playing along with this simple-minded innocence for years and years to come seemed for the moment an intolerable situation. Why don't you grow up a little? You don't really think there's ever been a chance of his selling that junk, do you? And I looked at her in a way that must have been very much like Bernie's own way of looking at me, the night he asked if I'd really thought he meant 25 at a time. Do you? Yes, I do, she said, putting her glass down. Or at least I did. I thought you did too. If you don't, it seems sort of cynical and dishonest to go on working for him, doesn't it? And she wouldn't talk to me all the way home. The real trouble, I guess, was that we were both preoccupied with two far more serious matters by this time. One was our recent discovery that Joan was pregnant, and the other was that my position at the United Press had begun to sink as steadily as any sinking fund dementia. My time on the financial desk had become a slow ordeal of waiting for my superiors to discover more and more of how little I knew about what I was doing. And now, however pathetically willing I might be to learn all the things I was supposed to know, it had become too much ludic it had become much too ludicrously late to ask. I was hunching lower and lower over my clattering typewriter there all day and sweating out the X. The kind, sad dropping of the assistant financial editor's hand on my shoulder. Can I speak to you inside a minute, Bob? And each day that it didn't happen was a kind of shabby victory. Early in December, I was walking home from the subway after one of those days, dragging myself down West 12th Street like a 70-year-old, when I discovered that a taxi cab had been moving beside me at a snail's pace for a block and a half. It was one of the green and white kind, and behind its windshield flashed an enormous smile. Bob! What's the matter there, Bob? You lost in thought or something? This where you live? When he parked the cab at the curb and got out, it was the first time I'd ever seen him in his working clothes. A twill cap, a buttoned sweater, and one of those columnar change making gadgets strapped to his waist. And when we shook hands, it was the first time I'd seen his fingertips stained a shiny gray from handling other people's coins and dollar bills all day. Close up, smiling or not, he looked as worn out as I felt. Come on in, Bernie. He seemed surprised by the crumbling doorway and dirty stairs of the house, and also by the whitewashed and poster-decorated austerity of our big single room, whose rent was probably less than half of what he and Rose were paying uptown. And I remember taking a dim bohemian's pride in letting him notice these things. I guess I had some snobbish notion that it wouldn't do Bernie Silver any harm to learn that people could be smart and poor at the same time. We couldn't offer him any ginger ale, and he said a glass of plain water would be fine, so it wasn't much of a social occasion. It troubled me afterwards to remember how constrained he was with Joan. I didn't. I don't think he looked at her full in the face when, what? I don't think he looked her full in the face once during the whole visit, and I wondered if this was because of our failure to return that invitation. Why is it that wives are nearly always blamed for what must at least as often as not be their husband's fault in matters like that. But maybe it was just that he was more conscious of his cab driver's costume in her presence than in mine. Or maybe he had never imagined that such a pretty and cultivated girl could live in such a stark surroundings, in such stark surroundings, and was embarrassed for her. I'll tell you what I dropped by about, Bob. I'm trying a new angle. And as he talked, I began to suspect from his eyes than his words, that something had gone very wrong with the long-range building program. Maybe a publishing friend of Dr. Corvo's had laid it on the line at last about the poor possibilities of our material. Maybe Dr. Corvo himself had grown snappish. 
Maybe there had been some crushing final communication from Wade Manley, or more crushingly from Wade Manley's agency representative. Or it might have been simply that Bernie was tired after his day's work in a way that no glass of plain water would help. In any case, he was trying a new angle. Had I ever heard of Vincent J. Poletti? But he gave me this name as if he knew perfectly well it wouldn't knock my eye out. And he followed it right up with the information that Vincent J. Poletti was a Democratic state assemblyman from Bernie's own district in the Bronx. Now this man, he said, is a man that goes out of his way to help people. Believe me, Bob, he's not just one of your cheap vote getters. He's a real public servant. What's more, he's a comer in the party. He's going to be our next congressman. So here's the idea, Bob. We get a photograph of me. I have this friend of mine that'll do it for I have this friend of mine who'll do it for nothing. We get it taken from the back seat of the cab with me at the wheel, kind of turning around and smiling like this. Get it? He turned his body away from his smiling head to show me how it would look. And we print this picture on the cover of a booklet, the title of the booklet. And here he sketched a suggestion of block lettering in the air. The title of the booklet is Take It From Bernie, Okay? Now, inside the booklet, we have a story, just exactly like the others you wrote, except this time it's a little different. This time, I'm telling a story about why Vincent J. Paletti is the man we need for Congress. I don't mean just a bunch of political talk either, Bob. I mean a real little story. Bernie, I don't see how this is going to work. You can't have a story about why anybody is the man we need for Congress. Who says you can't? And anyway, I thought you and Rose were, were Republicans. On the national level, yes. On the local level, no. Well, but hell, Bernie, we just had an election. There won't be another election for two years. But he only tapped his head and made a fairway, faraway gesture to show that in politics it paid a man to think ahead. Joan was over in the kitchen area of the room, cleaning up for the breakfast, cleaning up the breakfast dishes and getting the dinner started. And I looked to her for help, but her back was turned. It just doesn't sound right, Bernie. I don't know anything about politics. So? No schmo. What's to know? Do you know anything about driving a cab? No. And I sure as hell didn't know anything about Wall Street either. Wall Street, schmo street. But that was an interesting little story. I don't know, Bernie. Things are very unsettled right now. I don't think I'd better take on any more assignments for the time being. I mean, for one thing, I may be about to, but I couldn't bring myself to tell him about my UP problem. So I said, for one thing, Joan's having a baby now and everything's sort of, wow. Well, isn't that something? He was on his feet and shaking my hand. Isn't that something? Congratulations, Bob. I think this is, I think this is really wonderful. Congratulations there, Joni. And it seemed a little excessive to me at the time, but maybe that's, the way such news will always strike a middle-aged childless man. Oh, listen, Bob, he said when we settled down again. This Paletti thing will be duck soup for you, and I'll tell you what. Seeing as this is just a one-shot and there won't be any royalties, we'll make it ten instead of five. Is that a deal? Well, but wait a second, Bernie. I'm going to need some more information. I mean, what exactly does this guy do for the people? And it soon became clear that Bernie knew very little about Vincent J. <laughs> and it soon became clear that Bernie knew very little more about Vincent J. Paletti than I did. He was a real public servant. That was all. He went out of his way to help people. Oh, Bob, listen. What's the difference? Where's your imagination? You never needed any help before. Listen. What you just told me gives me one idea right off the bat. I'm driving along. These two kids hail me out in front of the maternity hospital, this young veteran and his wife. They got this little bitty baby, three days old, and they're happy as larks. Only here's the trouble. This boy's got no job or anything. They are they only just move here. They don't know anybody. Maybe they're Puerto Ricans or something. They got a week's rent on their room and that's it. Then they're broke. So I'm taking them home. They live right in my neighborhood and we're chatting away and I say, listen kids, I think I'll take you to see a friend of mine, Assemblyman Vincent J. Paletti. Naturally, only I don't tell them his name yet. I just say, this friend of mine. So we get there, and I go in and tell Paletti about it, and he comes out and talks to the kids and gives them money or something, see? You, get, you got a good share of your story right there. 
Hey, yeah. Wait a minute, Bernie. I got up and began dramatically pacing the floor the way people in Hollywood story conferences are supposed to do. Wait a minute. After he gives them money, he gets into your cab and you take off with him down Grand Concourse. And those two Puerto Rican kids are standing there on the sidewalk, kind of looking at each other. And the girl says, who was that man? And the boy looks very, ser very serious and says, honey, don't you know? Didn't you notice he was wearing a mask? And she says, oh, no, it couldn't be the... And he says, yes, yes, it was. Honey, that was the next... That was the lone assemblyman. And then listen, you know what happens next? Listen. Way off down the block, they hear his, this voice. And you know the voice is calling? And you know what the voice is calling? I sank to the floor on one trembling knee to deliver the punchline. It's calling, hi Bernie Silver away. And it may not look very funny written down, but it almost killed me. I must have laughed for at least a minute until I went into a coughing fit and Joan had to come out and pound me on the back. Only very gradually coming out of it did I realize that Bernie was not amused. He had chuckled in bewildered politeness during my seizure, but now he was looking down at his hands and there were embarrassing blotches of pink in his sober cheeks. I had hurt his feelings. I remember resenting it that his feelings could be hurt so easily and resenting it that Joan had gone back to the kitchen instead of staying to help me get out of this awkward situation and then beginning to feel very guilty and sorry as the silence continued until I finally decided that the only decent way of making it up to him was to accept the assignment. And sure enough, he brightened in instantly when I told him I'd give it a try. I mean, you don't necessarily have to use that about the Puerto Rican kids, he assured me. That's just one idea. Or maybe you could start it off that way and then go on to other things. The more the better. You work it out any way you like. At the door, shaking hands again, and it seemed that we'd been shaking hands all afternoon, I said, So that's ten for this one, right, Bernie? Right, Bob. Do you really think you should have told him you'd do it? Joan asked me the minute he'd gone. Why not? Well, because it is going to be practically impossible, isn't it? Look, will you do me a favor? Will you please get off my back? She put her hands on her hips. I just don't understand you, Bob. Why did you say you'd do it? Why the hell do you think? Because we're going to need ten bucks, that's why. In the end, I built... Oh, built schmelt. I put page one, and then page two, and then page three into the old machine, and I wrote the son of a bitch. It did start off with the Puerto Rican kids, but for some reason I couldn't get more than a couple of pages out of them. Then I had to find other ways for Vincent J. Paletti to demonstrate his giant goodness. What does a public servant do when he really wants to go out of his way to help people? Gives him money. That's what he does. And pretty soon I had Paletti forking over more than he could count. It got so that anybody in the Bronx who was even faintly up against it had only to climb into Bernie Silver's cab and say, The Paletti Place. And their trouble. And the worst part of it was my own grim conviction that it was the best I could do. Joan never saw the thing, because she was asleep when I finally managed to get it into an envelope and into the mail. And there was no word from Bernie or about him between the two of us for nearly a week. Then, at the same hour as his last visit, the frayed out end of the day, our doorbell rang. I knew there was going to be trouble as soon as I opened the door and found him smiling there, with spatters of rain on his sweater, and I knew I wasn't going to stand for any nonsense. Bob, he said, sitting down, I hate to say it, but I'm disappointed in you this time. He pulled my folded manuscript out of his sweater. This thing is... Bob, this is nothing. It's six and a half pages. That's not nothing, Bernie. Bob, please don't give me six and a half pages. I know it's six and a half pages, but it's nothing. You made this man into a fool, Bob. You got not you got him giving his dough away all the time. You told me to, you told me he gave dough, Bernie. To the Puerto Rican kids. I, I said, yes, sure. Maybe he could give a little. Fine. And now you come along and you've got him going around spending here like some kind of some kind of drunken sailor or something? I thought I might be going to cry, but my voice came out very low and controlled. Bernie, I did ask you what else he could do. I, I did tell you I didn't know what the hell else he could do. If you wanted him to do something else, you should have made that clear. But Bob, he said, standing up for emphasis... And his next words have often come back to me as the final despairing everlasting cry of the Philistine. 
Bob, you're the one with the imagination. I stood up too, so that I could, so that I could look down on. I stood up too, so that I could look down at him. I knew I was the one with the imagination. I also knew I was 22 years old and as tired as an old man. That I was about to lose my job. That I had a baby on the way and wasn't even getting along very well well with my wife. And now every cab driver, every two-bit politician's pimp and phony bugler in the city of New York was walking into my house and trying to steal my money. Ten bucks, Bernie. He made a helpless gesture, smiling. Then he looked over into the kitchen area where Joan was, and although I mean, I meant to keep my eyes on him, I must have looked there too, because I remember what she was doing. She was twisting a dish towel in her hands and looking down at it. Listen, Bob, he said. I shouldn't have said it was nothing. You're right. Who could take a thing six and a half pages long and say it's nothing? Probably a lot of good stuff in this thing, Bob. You want your ten bucks? All right, fine. You'll get your ten bucks. All I'm asking is this. First, take this thing back and change it it a little. That's all. Then we can. Ten bucks, Bernie. Now. His smile had lost its life, but it stayed right there on his face while he took the bill out of his wallet and handed it over. And while I went through a miserable little show of examining it to make goddamn sure it was a 10. Okay, Bob, he said, we're all square then, right? Right. Then he was gone, and Joan went swiftly to the door and opened it and called, Good night, Bernie. I thought I heard his footsteps pause on the stairs, but I didn't hear any answering good night from him. So I guessed that all he'd done was to turn around and wave to her, or blow her a kiss. Then, from the window, I saw him move out across the sidewalk and get into his taxi cab and drive away. All this time I was folding and refolding his money, and I don't believe I've ever held anything in my hand that I wanted less. The room was very quiet, with only the two of us moving around in, in it, while the kitchen area steamed and cracked crackled with the savory smells of a dinner that I don't think either of us felt like eating. Well, I said, that's that. Was it really necessary, she inquired, to be so dreadfully unpleasant to him? And this, at the time, seemed clearly to be the least loyal possible thing she could have ever, she could have said, the unkindest cut of all. Unpleasant to him? Unpleasant to him? Would you mind telling me just what the hell I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to sit around being pleasant while some cheap, lying, little parasitic leech of a cab driver comes in here and bleeds me, wa- bleeds me white? Is that what you want? Huh? Is that what you want? Then she did what she often used to do at moments like that. What I sometimes think I'd give anything in life never to have seen her do. She turned away from me and closed her eyes and covered her ears with both hands. Less than a week later, the assistant financial editor's hand did fall on my shoulder at last, right in the middle of a paragraph about domestic corporate bonds and moderately active trading. It was still well before Christmas, and I got a job to tide us over as a demonstrator of mechanical toys in a Fifth Avenue dime store. And I think it must have been during that dime store period, possibly while winding up a little tin and cotton kitten that went mew and rolled over, mew and rolled over, mew and rolled over. It was along in there sometime, anyway, that I gave up whatever was left of the idea of building my life on the pattern of Ernest Hemingway's. Some construction projects are just plain out of the question. After New Year's, I got some other idiot job. Then in April, with all the abruptness and surprise of spring, I was hired for $80 a week as a writer in an industrial public relations office, where the question of whether or not I knew what I was doing never mattered very much because hardly any other any of the other employees knew what they were doing either. It was a remarkably easy job, and it allowed me to save a remarkable amount of energy each day for my own work, which all at once began to go well. With Hemingway safely abandoned, I had be- I had moved on to an F. Scott Fitzgerald phase. Then, the best of all, I had begun to find what seemed to give any every indication of being my own style. The winter was over, and things seemed to be growing easier between Joan and me, too. And in the early summer, our first daughter was born. She caused a one or two month interruption in my writing schedule. But before long, I was back convinced that I was going from strength to strength. I had begun to bulldoze and dig 
and lay the foundation for a big, ambitious, tragic novel. I never did finish the book. It was the first in a series of more unfinished novels than I like to think about now, but in those early stages it was fascinating work, and the fact that it went slowly seemed only to add to its promise of eventual magnificence. I was spending more and more time each night behind my writing screen, emerging only to pace the floor with a head full of serene and majestic daydreams. And it was late in the year, all the way around to fall again one evening when Joan had gone out to the movies, leaving me as a babysitter, as babysitter, when I came out from behind the screen to pick up a ringing phone and heard, Bob Prentice, Bernie Silver. I won't pretend that I'd forgotten who he was, but it's not too much to say that for a second or two I did have trouble realizing that I'd ever really worked for him. That I could ever really have been involved, at first hand, in the pathetic delusions of a taxi cab driver. It gave me pause, which is to say that it caused me to wince and then to sheepishly grin at the phone. To duck my head and smooth my hair with my free hand in a bashful demonstration of noblesse oblige. This accompanied by a silent, humble vow that whatever Bernie Silver might want for me now, I would go out of my way to avoid any chance of hurting his feelings. I remember wishing Joan were home so that she could witness, witness my kindness. But the first thing he wanted to know about was the baby. Was it a boy or girl? Wonderful. And who did she look like? Well, of course, naturally. They never did look like anybody much at that age. And how did it feel to be a father? Huh? Feel pretty good? Good. Then he, then he took on what struck me as a strangely formal cap-holding tone, like that of a long-discharged servant inquiring after the lady of the house. And how's Miss Prentice? She had been Joan and Joni and sweetheart to him in his own home, and I somehow couldn't believe he'd forgotten her name. I could only guess that he hadn't heard her call out to him on the stairs that night after all, that maybe remembering only the way she'd stood there with her dish towel, he had ever even blamed her as the instigator of my own intransigence over the ten over the damned ten bucks. But all I could do now was to tell him she was fine. And how have you people been, Bernie? Well, he said, I've been all right. And here his voice fell to the shocked sobriety of a hospital room conferences. But I almost lost Rose a couple months back. Oh, it was okay now, he assured me. She was much better and home from the hospital and feeling well. But when he started talking about tests and radiology, I had the awful sense of doom that comes when the unmentionable name of cancer hangs in the air. Well, Bernie, I said, I'm terribly sorry she's been ill. And please be sure to give her our... Give her our what? Regards? Best wishes? Either one, it suddenly seemed to me, would carry the unforgivable taint of condescension. Give her our love, I said, and immediately chewed my lip in fear that this might sound the most condescending of all. I will, I will. I'll certainly do that for you, Bob, he said, and so I was glad to, and so I was glad I'd put the, it that way. And now what I called you about is this, and he chuckled. Oh, don't worry. No politics. Here's the thing. I've got this really terrifically talented boy working for me now, Bob. This boy's an artist. But right away, Bernie started talking about strips and layouts, so I was able to retire my competitive zeal in favor of the old, reliable, ironic detachment. What a relief. And great God, what a sickly, intricate thing a writer's heart is. Because do you know what I felt when he said that? I felt a twinge of jealousy. Artist? Was he? I'd show them who the hell the artist was around this little writing establishment. Oh, an artist, you mean. A comic strip artist. Right. Bob, you ought to see the way this boy can draw. You know what he does? He makes me look like me, but he makes me look like a little bit like Wade Manley, too. Do you get the picture? It sounds fine, Bernie. And now that the old detachment was working again, I could see that I'd have to be on my guard. Maybe he wouldn't be needing any more stories. By now, he probably had a whole credenza full of manuscripts for the, for the artist to work from, but he'd still be needing a writer to do the continuity, or whatever it's called, and the words for an artist's speech balloons. And I would now have to tell him as gently and gracefully as possible that it wasn't going to be me. Bob, he said, this thing is really building. Dr. Corvo took a look at these strips, and he said to me, Bernie, 
Forget the magazine business. Forget the book business. You found the solution. Well, it certainly does sound good, Bernie. And Bob, here's why I called. I know they keep you pretty busy down there at the UP, but I was wondering if you might have time to do a little. I'm not working for the UP anymore, Bernie. And I told him about the publicity job. Well, he said, that sounds like you're really coming up in the world there, Bob. Congratulations. Thanks. Anyway, Bernie, the point is I really don't think I'd have time to do any writing for you just now. I mean, I'd certainly like to. It isn't that. It's just that the baby does take up a lot of time here, and I've, then I've got my own work going. I'm doing a novel now, you see, and I don't really think I'd better take on anything else. Oh, well, okay then, Bob, don't worry about it. All I meant, you see, is that it really would have been a break for us if we could have made use of your, you know, your writing talent in this thing. I'm sorry too, Bernie, and I certainly do wish you luck with it. You may well have guessed by now what didn't occur to me, I swear, until an hour after I'd, say, I'd said goodbye to him, that this time Bernie hadn't wanted me as a writer at all. He'd thought I was still at the UP and might therefore be a valuable contact close to the heart of the syndicated comic strip business. I can remember exactly what I was doing when this knowledge came over me. I was changing the baby's diaper, looking down into her round, beautiful eyes as I expected her to congratulate me, or thank me for having once managed to avoid that terrible possibility of touching her skin with the point of the safety pin. I was doing that when I thought of the way his voice had paused in saying, we could have made use of your... During that pause, he must have abandoned whatever elaborate building plans might still have lain in saying, your connection's there at the EUP. And he didn't know I'd been fired. For all he knew, I might still have as many solid connections in the newspaper business as Dr. Corvo might have in, child psychology, in, the, in the child psychology field, or Wade Manley had in the movies. And he had chosen to finish it off with your writing talent instead. And so I knew that for all my finicking concern over the sparing of Bernie's feelings in that telephone conversation, it was Bernie in the end who had gone out of his way to spare mine. I can't honestly say that I've thought very much about him over the years. It might be a nice touch to tell you that I never get into a taxi cab without taking a close look at the driver's neck and profile, but it wouldn't be true. One thing that is true though, and it's just now occurred to me, is that very often, in trying to hit on the right wording for some touchy personal letter, I've thought of, I didn't have time to write you a short letter today, so I had to write you a long one instead. Whether I meant it or not, when I wished him luck with this comic strip, I, I think I started meaning it an hour later. I mean it now, wholeheartedly, and the funny part is that he might still be able to build it into something, connections or not. Sillier things than that have been built, have built empires in America. At any rate, I hope he hasn't lost interest in the project, in one form or another. But more than anything, I hope to God, and I'm not swearing this time, I hope to whatever God there may be that he hasn't lost Rose. Reading all this over, I can see that it hasn't built, been built very well. Its beams and joists, its very walls are somehow out of, the kilt, out of kilter. Its foundation feels weak. Possibly I failed to dig the right kind of hole in the ground in the first place. But there's no point in worrying about such things now, because it's time to put the roof on it, to bring you up to date on what happened to the rest of its, us builders. Everybody knows what happened to Wade Manley. He died unexpectedly a few years later in bed. And the fact that it was the bed of a young woman, not his wife, was considered racy enough to keep the tabloids busy for weeks. You can still see reruns of his old movies on television. And whenever I see one, I'm surprised all over again to find that he was a good actor, much too good, I expect, ever to have gotten caught in any cornball role as a cab driver with a heart as big as all outdoors. As for Dr. Corvo, there was a time when everybody knew what happened to him, too. It happened in the very early 50s, whichever year it was that the television companies built and launched their most massive advertising campaigns. One of the most massive of all was built around a signed statement by Dr. Alexander Corvo, eminent child psychologist to the effect that any boy or girl in our time whose home lacked a television set would quite possibly grow up emotionally deprived. Every other child psychologist, every art articulate liberal, and very nearly every parent in the United States came down on Alexander Corvo like a plague of locusts. And when they were done with him, there wasn't an awful lot of eminence left. 
Since then, I'd say offhand that the New York Times would give you a half a dozen Alexander Corvos for a single new bold Morris any day of the week. That takes the story right up, right on up to Joan and me. And now I'll have to give you the chimney top. I'll have to tell you what she, she and I were building collapsed too, or a couple of years ago. Oh, we're still friendly. No legal battles over alimony or custody or anything like that, but there you are. And where are the windows? Where does the light come in? Bernie, old friend, forgive me, but I haven't got the answer to that one. I'm not even sure there are any windows in this particular house. Maybe the light is just going to have to come in as best it can, through whatever chinks and cracks have been left in the builder's faulty craftsmanship. And if that's the case, you can be sure that nobody feels worse about it than I do. God knows, Bernie, God knows there certainly ought to be a window around here somewhere for all of us.